This video will be split into three major parts, exploring the ancient Chinese problem, some mathematical tools that Lagrange took credit for, and finally the connection. If you want to marvel at the connection, you really have to watch it all the way through. So here comes the ancient Chinese problem. There are a number of objects on the table. If you count them in groups of three, two will be left ungrouped. In groups of five, three will be left over. In groups of seven, two will be left over. What is the smallest number of objects? The numbers here are not very large, so you can start by trial and error and get the answer to be 23. Let's just check that it is true. It leaves a remainder of 2 divided by 3, a remainder of 3 divided by 5, and a remainder of 2 when divided by 7. So 23 definitely satisfies all three conditions. But if the numbers are much larger, how can you derive the answer? We first introduce a notation that will make our discussion a lot more systematic. We write a congruent to b modulo m. If a leaves a remainder of b when divided by m. When you think about it, the notion of remainder means a equals km plus b for some integer k. If we rearrange this equation, a minus b equals km. So a minus b is divisible by m. This is what I want you to think of when you see this notation. If we have a congruent to b and c congruent to d modulo m, that means the difference between a and b and that between c and d are divisible by m. So a plus c minus b minus d is divisible by m. And hence, a plus c is congruent to b plus d modulo m. So we can do addition for this notation. If we have a congruent to b modulo m, then the difference between a and b is divisible by m. And hence, k times a minus b is also divisible by m. Since ka minus kb is divisible by m, ka is congruent to kb modulo m. So we can do multiplication by a constant on this notation. The original problem has not left us yet. Using this notation, if we write x as the number of objects, then x is congruent to 2 modulo 3, 3 modulo 5, and 2 modulo 7. If we want to generalize this problem, we would have this system of equations. This does look scary, so we would do what any normal humans would do in this situation, procrastinate. Now we look at the other side of the story, Lagrange. One thing that Lagrange is known for is polynomial interpolation. Suppose that you have these different data points, which are absolutely error-free, and you want to figure out the relationship between the two variables. There are tons of different models, like linear, logarithmic, or exponential. But when there are more than three data points, it is not guaranteed that those data points would fit any of those models. Polynomial models are the most versatile and can fit as many data points as you want. So let's say Px is the required polynomial, which passes through the points x1, y1 all the way to xn, yn. That means we have a system of equations like so. This monstrosity looks quite familiar, don't you think? Enough with the procrastination, we now have more problems to deal with. However, we can tackle these two in similar ways, which is the connection. Let's tackle the polynomial problem on the right first, because it is actually less complicated. The general idea is to first tackle a lot of much simpler cases. Instead of this general case, we solve this case. Let's say we have solved it, and call the polynomial to be P1. Then similarly, we can solve for P2 all the way to Pn. Now what Lagrange did was really simple but amazing, so I highly encourage you to pause the video and think about how we can make use of P1 all the way to Pn to solve for the general case. Now consider this polynomial. When x equals x1, this polynomial returns y1 times 1, 
plus y2 times 0 all the way to yn times 0. So this polynomial returns y1 when it is fed with x1 as input. Similarly, when x equals x2, this polynomial would return y2 and so on. And so it satisfies the original set of equations. So can we pull a similar trick for the ancient Chinese problem? Again, for this complicated case, we split it into smaller cases and solve for them separately. And now we similarly consider the number x defined as a1x1 adding up all the way to anxn. We need to be a little bit careful here, because we are dealing with these congruent signs, not equal signs. Luckily, we have previously demonstrated that you can view them as pretty much the same thing when it comes to addition and multiplication. And so, we have the same valid conclusion that x fulfills the entire system of equations. Right now, the connection is pretty clear. These two seemingly unrelated problems have a very similar general problem-solving techniques, and it would be even more amazing if there is a more subtle similarity between the two problems. There is, and that relation is about the solution of those simpler cases of the general case. For both problems, we first solve for all the equations except for the one with 1 in it. This is pretty easy for both problems. Then we adjust the solution by multiplying by something so that the remaining equation is also satisfied. This adjusting step, however, is much more difficult for the Chinese problem in general. For the polynomial problem, we use something called vector theorem, which says that if f of lambda equals 0 and f is a polynomial with degree higher than 1, then x minus lambda must be a factor of f. That means P has to be composed of factors including x minus x2 all the way to x minus xn. So if we ignore the first equation for a sec, it will have the solution to be the product of these factors. If we need to consider the first equation, we multiply by a constant k. To obtain this constant, we just need to substitute x equals x1. Since p of x1 is 1, k has to be the reciprocal of the product of these x1 minus something. Then this polynomial p1 fulfills all these equations. By doing this for all the other simpler cases, we finally have Lagrange polynomial. Usually, it is written much more succinctly like so. If you don't understand this notation, don't worry, because it is just a shorthand version of the entire expression. This looks complicated, but the principle of obtaining such an expression is pretty easy to understand. A similar trick can be used for the simpler cases of the ancient Chinese problem. If we ignore the first equation for a sec, that means x is a multiple of all m's except m1. So we call for the lowest common multiple of them. Then we just have to multiply by some constant so that it also satisfies the first equation. There is a specific algorithm to do this, but this video is long enough, so I will put the algorithm in the next video. If you are really interested, visit or revisit my very first two videos because that algorithm is related to continued fractions, which are mentioned in them. We are now going to do an actual implementation of this entire solution on the ancient Chinese problem we started off with. We need to find solutions to these three sets of equations first. For the first set, x1 is congruent to 1 modulo 3 and divisible by 5 and 7. 35 is not congruent to 1 modulo 3, so 35 is not the solution here. What about 70? 70 is definitely congruent to 1 modulo 3, so we set x1 to be 70. What about the second set? x2 has to be congruent to 1 modulo 5 and a multiple of 3 and 7. 21 fits these criteria, and so we set x2 to be 21. Similarly, for the third set, we set x3 to be 15. So now, since the original system of equations has remained as 2, 3 and 2, we multiply x1 by 2, x2 by 3, and x3 by 2, and now we get 233. This 
isn't quite 23 that we found by trial and error in the beginning. So what's the problem? There is no flaw in our reasoning when we try to work this out theoretically, so why would there be such a discrepancy? 23 and 233 are indeed solutions to this system of equation. So that tells us that the solutions are not unique. If there are two roots x and x dash, then the difference between x and x dash must be divisible by 3, 5, and 7, which means divisible by 105. So since we have worked out 233, to get 23, we just have to subtract 105 until we get something smaller than 105, in this case 23. And then now, we know that 23 is the smallest possible solution. This entire process was known since the ancient Chinese. They even had poems about this process. This poem basically states that we multiply the remainder with divisor 3 by 70, that with divisor 5 by 21, and that with divisor 7 by 15. Then subtract 105 until you get the answer. It is important to note that we would definitely have solutions using this process if all the m's are mutually relatively prime. But if not, it is not guaranteed that this would have any solutions at all. Since 3, 5, and 7 are mutually co-prime, we definitely have solutions for the original Chinese problem. This small caveat is known as the Chinese Remainder Theorem. This entire video has been taken from a book written by a late famous Chinese mathematician, Hua Lo Gong. He was definitely one of the most influential mathematicians in China and had opened up a lot of research areas. Personally, the reason I found this book inspiring is that prior to reading, I knew Lagrange polynomial interpolation and the Chinese remainder theorem separately but had never thought that these two are correlated. This only means that there are much more in mathematics to discover because even these two seemingly unrelated topics can still be intricately related. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like, leave a comment, and subscribe with notifications on for more of these math videos. If you happen to see one of my videos on the suggested, click on it to help support this channel. Bye.